Now let me just adjust that. Oh, lose the double chin. One moment, guys. Give me a second. This is 15 seconds of imperative cosmetic. There we go. Guys, good to be here. Um, I can't break down reality any better or any more than it's been broken down for you already by Robert David Steele. Um, the only difference between him and I is that he's telling people we will also separate the throat. The only difference is I don't have I might be moving to the place. I want to talk about three words today, and I'm only going to speak for five minutes, just so you know. But they're two of the most powerful speakers in the land behind me. Uh, friends of mine, I'm honored to have brought me into the wake of this incredible tour. We started it a few days ago, we've given ourselves two weeks to. Get into the flow of things. It's going to build towards a much more than I'm going to We've got some very big fireworks happening towards the end of the tour. We never did it three months ago. It's a hell of an undertaking. It's a big logistical uh, undertaking. I want to talk about stars and I'll talk about bombs and all the fun of poisons. I'll tell you what, because the three things we talk about is spells, bombs, and poisons. The spells are everywhere. Every single time you look at the screen, every time you look at the right hand, every time you look at the television screen, if you're foolish enough to be in the 21st century, yeah. how many do you have to do with the very society? Fact is, we are constantly bombarded by the spell by the way, and we expect that this way, for instance, we need to preserve all the serpents for thousands of years. The fool that we are held in. Is connected to the spells, the spells of the words, the use of the words, the symptoms of the And this is connected into how we are indentured into the bones. The bones are connected to the upper case lecture. Many of you will know this, the trust, the birth certification, the certificate of natural love and birth. This is where you are indentured into the fiction of your own life, the fiction of your own treasury. Bond, that's what you are from birth. Bonding your children to the state to the ground at birth through registration. Registering your cars, registering your cars, registering your homes, registering everything. And I'll tell you a little something which another man in the house at the back there of the cell is great deal about. And if you've got time up there, have a chat with him this week. Put your hand up here. Get up here. Right, you right. It's all about the bonds, and it's all about how those bonds are held and contained by the Vatican, by the Crown of England, given to you by the U.S. Treasury Department of work with the Federal Federal Reserve. By the grace of God, that has been disentangled. I am now here to live on the courtesy of President Donald Trump. That process is coming with it. And it's going to do things. About the most I like of those three, the voices. They can say that they can say that the synthetic chemical dye used to come out the t shirts and the jumpers and the shoes, the leather, whatever it is that you're wearing, is poisoning your body and skin leaves. Whatever you're putting into your body is poisoning you. Whatever you're putting into your body is poisoning you. Whatever you're putting into your body is poisoning you. The cosmetics you're putting on your face, the shampoos, the conditioners, the toothpaste, every single product you put in your body and on your body is a poison today. Every single one. And Amazon.com owns the high street. There is no high street. Do not pay in to that. Do not pay in to the poisons. I would talk about taxes on my own stage. This is his stage. I will not talk about that today, out of courtesy. But I think you know where I'm going with this. Spells, bonds, and poisons. And friends, it does come back to government. And that does mean govern, control, meant is mind in Latin. This was always encrypted and always encoded in the plantation slavery, which we have always been indentured into. It's been thousands of years, friends. This group of people on this stage, coupled with your heartbeat, is beginning the process, just like Lazarus, of resurrecting ourselves from the dead. God bless you all. Thank you.
I guess I have to correct everybody at least once when they come up here. It's not his stage, it's our stage, Sasha. What are you talking about? All right, thank you. We're ready to move on to our attorney, but first I got to tell you a story. You know, I've already stated, I think the farmers are doing God's work. I'm not, not the only one doing God's work, but doing God's work, taking care of his creation and improving the planet and improving mankind. So we automatically think that we're on God's good graces. Well, Farmer John came to an untimely death and he found himself at the gates of St. Peter. And he said, Farmer John, I'm here to get into heaven. St. Peter looked at the list and said, no, nope, no Farmer John today. Farmer John kind of got a little irate and he said, well, there has to be a place in heaven for all farmers. We've taken care of God's creation. We've improved man who is in the image of God. And we just have to have a place in heaven. St. Peter says, nope, no Farmer John today. Boom, he hits the button and straight to hell goes Farmer John. Well, I don't know how many of you know how ingenuity the farmer is. Innovative ingenuity, we could come up with anything, take a little duct tape and wire, bailing wire, we can make anything happen. Wasn't long this farmer was making hell fairly comfortable. He even found a way to create some refrigeration. Had an elevator moving around hell, and hell was getting far too comfortable for God's liking. So God rings up the devil and he says, Hey, devil, I understand we made a mistake. Y'all got a farmer, and we're supposed to have him up here in heaven. The devil says, No, God, you know the deal. Once you're in hell, you're in hell. Well, God too got a little irate. He said, Look, devil. Either you get me my farmer back up here to heaven, or we're going to file a lawsuit against you. Well, the devil just laughed, and he said, well, good luck finding an attorney up there. <laughs> you got a lot of friends in this audience, Lee, I can tell you right now. One of the attorneys headed for that pearly gates for the great work that she's doing and bringing all of the injustices on mankind to the forefront and holding people accountable. Lee Dundas. Right now, give it up for your attorney. Thank you so much, Trent. So it's true I'm an attorney, and I don't usually lead with that fact because it's the quickest way to get yourselves kicked out of a, a good party. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard my name before, my mother gave me extra letters. It's Lee. It's pronounced L-E-E, -E, but it's actually L-E-I-G-H. And you can find me, since all the people up here are getting censored faster than we can shake a stick at, you can find me at Lee Dundas, D-U-N-D-A-S dot com. It's a pleasure to be here. For those of you who don't know what I was up to prior to March of last year, um, I was working against the child brothel industry in Southeast Asia. For those of you who don't know this, human trafficking is the second largest and single fastest growing criminal economy on the planet for the simple reason that there is more profit in selling a seven-year-old to a sex buyer than there is in selling cocaine to an addict. So I was busy in the child brothel industry over there up until March when I assessed that there might be a greater human rights threat occurring in our own backyard. And that, out of everything I say today, should probably scare you more than anything else. But the countries I work in are communist or formerly communist. They have coups every five, six, seven years like Thailand does because they have never had the rights in that country that we've been busy taking for granted for far too long in this country. They have genocides. They have had genocides in the time that I have been alive. The communists moved into Cambodia and started shooting everybody who had any sort of intellectual capital, the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, the accountants, who could have posed a threat in terms of pushing back against the communists. They started shooting them face down into the ditches. And I am here to tell you that I do believe that we have a communist threat that is going on right now. And I am trained to look for this kind of stuff because if you don't look for it in Southeast Asia, you end up dead. One of the towns I work in is a little red light jihadi district on the Thailand-Malaysia border. It had 330 bombs go off last calendar year because in addition to having 140 child brothels in it, it is also on the dividing line of those two countries where radicalized Islamic jihadists are practicing their bombing skills by taking out the brothels on the other side of the river. 
So I am trained to look for danger and I am telling you we are in extremely dangerous times right now. And I do believe there's a fourth Reich rising in our backyard. I really, really do. And in the same manner that I would never take an off duty Navy SEAL who went running out the door swearing that he heard a bomb ticking out there that he was going to go defuse for us. I would never say to that gentleman, sir, I think you're crazy because I don't hear that bomb. Instead, I would say, well, I think I'm going to go out this door. <laughs> and worst case scenario, if I run out that door, I get a little too much exercise if he's wrong. Best case scenario is I save my life. You don't undercut your subject matter experts. You listen to them. And the fact that we have people from communist countries, from Southeast Asia, from Eastern Europe, from Cuba, from Venezuela, who fled to this country and are running around right now saying, there is communism growing in our country, and you've got the mainstream mockingbird media and everybody else on the wrong side of the fence going, they don't know what they're talking about. BS, they do know. And we would be very well served to start listening to them instead of start dismissing them. So that's the first thing I, uh, I have to say to you today. The second thing I have to say to you talks really to the issue of totalitarian takeovers because I do think that we are in the process of that. And I also know this much. It doesn't matter if you're a communist or a fascist. If you're a narcissist with a big ego that wants to do your neighbor in, whether you call it Stalin or Hitler or uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia, they to a man follow the exact same five steps in doing their brothers and sisters in. And the first step is you whip society into an absolute frenzy over absolutely nothing. You go running around like Hitler did in Nazi Germany in the late 1930s, you set fire to a government building, and then you blame it on the communists and you say, hey, the commies are coming, the commies are coming, and you run around like Paul Revere, and you get society so darn adrenalized and incapable of thinking because they're living in fear but they go, oh my gosh, yeah, the communists must be coming. And you use that as a false flag. Remember how Robert David Steele was talking about false flag? As a false flag event to usher in your actual agenda, which of course had nothing to do with communists. He just wanted to take out the Jews. And he used that as a reason and a, and a doorway to change 400 laws over the next six years that allowed him to do what he really wanted to do, which had nothing to do with communism and everything to do with burning Jewish people in ovens. The second step of the totalitarian takeover is you blame somebody for that little problem that you have now created, you know, mountain out of a molehill like nothing. And of course, we know who Hitler blamed.